Right, good afternoon. <laughs> I was asked to um, do a sort of companion piece to, to what Matthew did, because Matthew did about the sort of inclusion model and, and the mainstream schools, where I was asked to look at the pros and cons of a specialist provision. I have to say, having listened to Matthew, I think, is it Sheffield you're in? I think Sheffield is a remarkably lucky place. Uh, because I have to say, sadly, it's not my experience of mainstream on the whole uh, and what I get to, to deal with. What, what Judith didn't tell me when she asked me to do this companion piece was the fact that I'd be sandwiched between a virtuoso pianist <laughs> and, and, and the encore of the main act, which, let's face it, despite my ego, that's who you're here to see, isn't it? <laughs> so uh, I'll try and make this as painless as I possibly can and, and quick as, to keep Judith happy, as quick as I possibly can to, so we can get to the main act again. Um, so, the pros and cons of specialist education, or as I often prefer to call it, the case for the defence, <laughs> because actually that's how it often feels. And I work with a lot of enlightened people in local authorities, parents, professionals, loads of people, and they do know the kind of benefits that a school like mine has. Equally, I, however, I've dealt with people who have very entrenched views about schools like mine, and consider them elitist, or segregatist, or exclusive, and that actually what we often do is deny a child the right of entitlement to a curriculum. I have to be honest and say, I usually correct them at that point and say, your semantics are wrong. You're talking about the wrong kind of right. Because it's not a right of entitlement that I often see. It's a right of passage. And it's not often been a very pleasant one for those young people that end up on my doorstep. Because they've been through a lot of damaging times. But to try and make this slightly interesting, I'm going to think about your right of entitlement. You're going to get a right of entitlement to a curriculum, and hopefully in this talk, I'm going to cover a bit of history, a, few bit, a bit of maths, so that hopefully some mathematicians in here, and a bit of science as well, just to keep you in your right of entitlement. So who am I? As you said, I'm the head teacher of um, Pontville School, which is down the road, which is part of the Witherslack group. We have schools all over the country, all specialist schools. Uh, all to do with a range of different difficulties, autistic spectrum. My background has been for the last 25 years or 20 to 25 years in some kind of communication disorder. I started off as a mainstream teacher. In fact, in some respects, I'm the opposite of what Matthew did. He started in special, went to mainstream. I started in mainstream and I've moved to special. Uh, and certainly what I found in mainstream that I could not really do the kind of teaching I wanted to do. I felt a bit like, if anybody remembers um, another Brick in the Wall part three, I should have asked Derek to play it. Um, if anybody remembers the sort of film of that, I felt like the sort of malicious teacher that was pushing kids through this straining machine, a sausage maker machine, and out came kids at the end. And it didn't feel like it was something I was in touch with and felt supportive of because I didn't know the kids. So I moved, actually, I, I went abroad and I ironically got a job as a teacher. Uh, and uh, a few years later I came back and I found that actually abroad I could actually have that more personable approach to dealing with kids. And the only way I could find that in this country was in the special needs sector. So that's where I moved into. But if we're going to talk about special needs, what I want to do... Oh, sorry, no, before I do, disclaimer. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll do what Matthew did, just in case. Disclaimer from the point of view of... Uh, it, my staff will tell you, and I know there's a back row of them there waiting to heckle. Uh, my staff will tell you that actually if you put me in a room by myself for 30 minutes and tell me to talk, I'll probably upset myself. Okay? Uh, <laughs> Put me in a room with 400 people. Somebody in here is not going to be happy with what I'm saying by the end of this 40 minutes, OK? So just to warn you. But let's narrow down the field. Let's look, establish a common ground. When I talk about specialist education, the kind of children I deal with, I'm not talking about units. I'm not talking about the kind of setting that Matthew's in. I'm not talking about proofs where kids come in and go back into school or come in and go on to somewhere else. I'm talking about the very small niche position of the fact that kids go into a special school that has a designation for a particular need. Okay? So we're talking about a fairly restricted population of, of important kids. And I'm going to do a bit of a stop press because some of you have noticed recently the government, after the launch of the Green Paper, has been talking about thousands of, of young people identified with SEN are not really correctly identified. Actually, what they could do with is some better teaching. So all those teachers in the audience, including myself, it's my fault and your fault. Uh, and actually, uh, also pastoral care. That's the government's nice way of saying parenting. Any parents in here? It's your fault as well, apparently. <laughs> uh, so it's, but I actually challenge some of those figures, really, because let's have a look at... A, here comes a bit of history, really. Let's look at... See if we can guess how many kids we think are in the education system at this moment in time. So, number of pupils in England, in school, is it 4 million, 8 million, 6 million, or 8 million? So, how many think it's 4 million in school at this present moment in time? Okay, not many. 
Six million. Oh, a few more. Eight million. Well done. Well done to all you. Eight million it is. Now, just for those people who feel a bit depressed because you got the first one wrong, there's a second question here, just to help you out. Okay. <laughs> Number of pupils in special schools, so the kind of setting I'm talking about. Is it A, 56,000, B, 94,000, or C, 140,000? How many are going for A? How many are going for B? How many go for C? It's B. 94,000. So if anybody got both right, well done. You're in the mainstream class. Off you go. <laughs> <laughs> so in real terms, we're talking about a population of 1.1% of the, of the whole country, really. Keep that number in mind, 1.1%. And when the government launched the Green Paper and talked about there being too many kids in schools with identified special needs over the time they're in school, they quoted 20%. So keep that number in your mind as well. Because, as we'll see, things haven't changed that much, really. Baroness Warnock, back in the 80s, 85, I think it was, roughly, came out with a statement after she was asked to look at special education needs. In fact, I feel sorry for her, really, because she was much maligned about being the person behind inclusion and pushing it, and actually people wanting more inclusion because of what she said. But that's actually what she said at the time. Those numbers look, should look quite familiar, really, shouldn't they? 20% of the population will have some kind of special needs during their lifetime in school. 2% are likely to need some kind of special supervision. Right now, it's 1.17%. She wasn't far off in 1985, 30 years ago. So actually, despite the kind of comments you hear from a government, the numbers haven't changed that much. In fact, hardly at all, really. So you have to question the philosophy behind it. What I do see is, is an ideology at this moment in time overruling pragmatics of how it needs to be delivered because actually it has a major effect in most places. Matthew's managed to do a cultural change and a cultural shift in the setting he's in. Sadly, that's not what I see in other places and it's not what Warnock saw when she went back to it in 2005 when she was asked to review it because this is what she was saying then. And I would say that was pretty accurate to the kind of feelings that I see from parents that come through my door. And the most recent research has been done in mainstream schools. And that dissatisfaction is also being felt there as well. And I think, I think, again, Matthew alluded to it this morning, that actually often the needs that exist outstrip the funding that actually comes with that child into that mainstream setting, which almost makes it impossible for the school to succeed right from day one. And you also have the issue of, the, is the need compatible with the setting that they're actually in and they're being expected to deal with and the size of the place and the noise that might be involved. Some people have even stronger views on things like inclusion, like Mr. Macbeth. He wrote a paper in the cost, called The Cost of Inclusion and then was on BBC Radio, I think it was, where he was interviewed and actually made that quote there. Inclusion could be seen as a form of abuse. Ouch, that hurt. And I'm not convinced I'd be that strong in my view about inclusion because I actually see it succeed at times. However, as I've said at the bottom underneath there, I know a hell of a lot of parents that have come to my school that would say it is because they've seen the damage to their child. They've seen the impact that it's had and the damage that then is expected to be undone by a school like mine. So although they were strong views, they're commonly held amongst quite a few parents that I meet. And summing all that up, the House of Commons Education and Skills Committee identified that. I think, it, I think that's a lovely example of political correctness. That they managed to take all those strong views and distill it down to a dissatisfaction amongst parents and professionals. That's called political speak, I think. Yet after that, out came the Green Paper and this claim that there's too many young people with special needs and actually we need to address that. Now rather than me stand here on my soapbox for the next 30 minutes, I thought it's better that you see what people have seen in my school and what they deal with in you know, this kind of setting, especially the setting that I've got. So I thought rather than me talk to you about my opinions, I'll give you the opinions that I, I gathered over the last couple of months when I, when I found out about this 
uh, from parents, past parents, past pupils, local authorities, present parents and present pupils to see what they think. Because actually, in the end, they're real people. They're the ones with the real needs and the real service users. Okay? So I thought it would be better for you to see what they think of a specialist centre and the advantages and the disadvantages of it. So I had past parents were the first people I contacted. And so we sent out a questionnaire. Doesn't matter what level of ability the child was, as long as they'd been there in the last three years. Okay? And we asked the parents and then we asked the pupils also if they could complete one. These were the positive features that they felt existed from a special school. And as you can see, what they were really pointing out was the niche provision, the expertise that's in that setting and the knowledge that's in that setting to deal with their child. And they were looking for specialism. They weren't looking for inclusion. They weren't looking for generalised provision. They were looking for something specific. However, the negative side were quite clear as well, particularly distance from home. And there's not a great deal I could do about that because I can't move the school physically. And that is a problem because some of our kids literally walk around the corner from where they live in Ormskirk some of them travel 300 miles to get to what I do. They come up on a Monday morning, arrive about 12 o'clock and leave about lunchtime on a Friday because they have to travel that far to get to what they need. And in doing that, the other things became a problem. Local peer contact, generalisation is a huge one. It's a lot, we've put a lot of work into that, but we still need to do a lot more work on that because we need to discuss that kind of thing with parents because you've got to work with parents all the time because you know your kids better than anybody else does. And that generalisation is about getting those skills from the specialist setting into the actual mainstream setting of, of society, which is the kind of thing that Matthew does. The reasons they took their child out of the mainstream education setting were not surprisingly the opposite reason, really. A, a poor awareness of need that seems to exist in most secondary schools in particular. Anxieties and bullying, and they were often linked together in the questionnaires when they came back, saying that their child was getting more and more anxious and actually was being more and more targeted. Despite work that I'm sure was done with the young people to actually acknowledge the differences, I'm afraid what it did was actually isolate them and identify them in a lot of cases. And then there were issues over access to therapies and their behaviours of their child and also other children in the school. So they were asked to evaluate it with the past parents and say, well, what do you think then? They were asked two simple questions. If you had your time again, would you choose to educate your child in a specialist school? No one dissented. When they were judged, would you judge it as a successful provision in a specialist school? Again, no one actually questioned that. Now you might say, well of course not, because that's what they chose. And that's my point. They needed to choose that. They didn't want to come to my school. They didn't want to have their child go into something that is separate from where everybody else had gone, but they had no choice, because really they knew that's what was needed. So it doesn't surprise me that they actually voted well for that part of it, because they'd seen the actual outcomes for their young person. But I did ask them to consider not just our school, but specialist provision and mainstream provision, and rank it. You won't be surprised to know that they didn't like mainstream, because they'd had a difficult time. They, they did like specialist settings because they'd had a good time. So it tells you exactly what you'd expect to see, but it's a very telling sign that they actually have to go to something like ours to actually achieve that, rather than actually being able to get it locally in the mainstream sector. These are some of the traditional comments that they also wrote about what had happened to their child. And I think they're very telling. And I don't think many people in this room would actually suggest that they haven't heard that or felt that themselves, especially if they're a parent. But we also felt it was important to find out what the pupils thought. They're the ones that had actually been through the system, although the parents had, I suppose, felt like they'd been through the system with them. There was the issue of what did the pupils that had been through feel? And before we do that, you really need to know where they've gone. The vast majority of kids at Lee School like mine go on to, to carry on in education. They either go into training or primarily into college. In the, our setting here, we, uh, the last two years, 100% of the Lancashire pupils that come to our school have gone into mainstream colleges and done very well. And one, in fact, I'm, we'll be talking about later on, has done remarkably well. I think what I've seen is that a lot of kids enjoy their primary school education because of the way it's set up with one teacher, with one classroom area, with that child's 
with, with the young persons having their own chair in their own, on their own table with their own drawer in, in the sort of where they put their work. Whereas, in, and, and actually in tertiary, they get a lot of support in colleges and into universities. The gap seems to be, as Matthew said, is it secondary is a tough place. Yes, it is. And that seems to be the toughest place for them. What they liked when they were asked about it was friends. They made friends. And it's some, something I think Temple uh, made comment to, which was shared interests. I remember one young man in particular who came into my school for a couple of days of induction, looked at, around in awe and said, they're all like me. That's inclusion. <laughs> for the first time in his life, he felt part of something. He felt included. He felt he was normal, the same as everybody else. And that, for him, was the most important thing. And he went on to great things. So friendship is the thing that they get the most out of their time in my school. It would be great if they leave with lots of GCSEs because they're capable of doing them. But to be frankly honest, if I don't make them able to cope with society and the demands of it, and they have actually made some kind of social contact that is meaningful to them, if I can't do that, I've failed. Irrelevant of what they achieve in grades and, and exams. That is key. And that is what they found the most valuable. Negative-wise was travelling, just like the parents said. And there was also the lack of freedom. And let's be honest, it's true. Special schools, if they've got one term big con about them, is they're goldfish balls. You miss nothing in a special school because you, you, you see their day from the moment they arrive all the way through to the, day, the, the moment they leave, they're being observed and worked with and, and helped and support. But the problem with that, of course, is you see everything that goes wrong which for most schools wouldn't happen. It, you know, there'd be a normal interaction between pupils that wouldn't be seen by adults, and there's a degree of lack of freedom that comes with that, I'm afraid. So yes, we need to work hard on that and look at how we address that kind of thing. When they were asked to say, well, what do you remember of mainstream? That's what they could remember. Either feeling excluded or literally being excluded. <laughs> being bullied, being misunderstood. They didn't feel included. These are the other additional kind of comments that they made. I think the last comment's an exaggeration because they managed to fill the questionnaire in. <laughs> so after we talked to the past parents and the past pupils, we talked to local authorities, and I sent them a questionnaire as well. Now, admittedly, I'm not going to send them a questionnaire that says, go and tell us what's wrong with your schools, because I wasn't going to get a very large response if I'd have done that. Uh, and actually, I didn't get a, if I'm honest, I didn't get a massive response from local authorities anyway, but thank you if any of them are in there. Thank you to those that did. Um, but, but I asked them from the point of view of, well, what is it you like about special schools? What is it you need? What is it you use? What is it you want more of? What is it you find difficult from special schools? And to summarise what they were coming up with, they identified this. So they all had a, a good range of provision available to them. Sorry, where am I? Oh, I'm sorry. ASC, Autistic Spectrum Condition. SLI, Speech and Language Impairment. MLD, Moderate Learning Difficulty. PMLD, Physical... Uh, PMLD, Physical Help. <laughs> Thank you. Learning difficulty. <laughs> and, and generic, they had a wide, you know, schools that are open to lots of different special needs. So I do apologise. Uh, then the actual provision they use most at the moment, or the type they, they most use, was autistic spectrum. So if the, the kind of specialist provision they sought the most was either to do with autistic spectrum or behaviour, BESD, behaviour, emotional, social difficulties. That's what they were actually, if you will, buying on the, on the behalf of the young people. They didn't really use a lot of uh, moderate learning difficulty anymore. They did want day provision and outreach, they didn't really want residential. So that's what authorities were looking for when they were looking for special schools that were away from their own county. And then they were asked really, well, what, do you, what are the positive features about when you use good special schools? What is it you see that you like, that works? And it's not dissimilar from what some of the parents were saying, which is the ability to get them included in some way in their local environment somehow, and also the flexibility, the ability to actually respond when they need you to respond. 
And yes, it's often the case when my phone rings, they do want a quick turnaround of somebody coming in because they want them to assess them and get them in school as fast as they can because they need that flexibility of response. On the negative side, it was when they actually couldn't supply support into the mainstream and when it was a long way from home and that transition didn't take place very well and they weren't supported and the parents didn't feel supported. So local authorities had a clear idea that really special schools had to be very flexible and give a specific package to everybody that came through the door. And that's actually what they wanted more of. And we've worked very hard to actually do most of those things. We offer respite. Uh, outreach is done through uh, Bellevue, which is actually part of the Withers Light group. Uh, home support services. We often do um, the therapists, which are also here today. They do uh, workshops for parents. So we try and do a lot of those on behalf of, therapy, uh, on behalf of parents and authorities so that we can actually get the message out there of the kind of need and support that these young people need. Then we asked present parents and what they thought. Not surprisingly, that was the biggest response I got. I got a lot of answers from, from present parents and as a result got a lot of information across far more areas that they felt were affecting their children's lives. And those were the answers that came back. The same ones are still the biggest. The issues of the specialism, the issues of staff expertise. What was interesting was ethos came up more. Uh, the recognition of the support services and therapies came up more. I suppose it was perhaps more prominent in their minds. Uh, but that clearly were the things that they were looking for and the positive features that they were getting from actually sending their child to a specialist school. The negative features were those. And by limited perspectives, what most of them seem to be go talking about is the restricted opportunities that occur in most special schools. And again, we've worked hard on that because we now offer something like 11 GCSEs. And it's very difficult to do that in such a small setting as ours. So limited perspectives looked at that and also the opportunity for them to go out and try things for themselves. And again, that's something that Temple related to, which is not hiding our young children away, but giving them the opportunity to do things. And sometimes that means they do fail. And, that, and that's painful to watch at times, but you need them to go through that and feel how things can be difficult when they're in different settings. Because that's the way they will learn it, as long as you're there in some respect to support them and put in the, actual, the answers for them later on when they found it difficult so they can go through it again. Distance away came up, and again, the access to mainstream. When we asked them why they'd taken their children out of a, of, a of a mainstream setting, the same things were coming up again. So whether they're parents that have been there in the last three to five years, or whether they were parents that have been there or are, are there now, it was pretty much the same pattern. All to do with their child's ability to cope in that setting and become very anxious. Not surprisingly, the reason they chose specialists are the opposite of that. They wanted their child to achieve learning and, and access to education and that specialist knowledge because they knew that was going to be the answer to what was actually on offer or not on offer in the mainstream, the mainstream, mainstream setting. And then they were asked to evaluate it. And again, not surprisingly, 100% said, yes, that's what they like, that's what they wanted. And then they were asked, well, actually, it's not perfect. Nothing's perfect. We're changing all the time and developing our services all the time. What would they, as parents, want from settings like ours? And actually, ironically, even though they were saying they didn't like their child being in the mainstream <laughs> setting, most parents wanted something that actually allowed them to generalise those skills to the outside world for a very simple reason. Sooner or later, that's where they're going to be. And sooner or later, they will have to cope with it. So they need some exposure to it. They would have preferred things to have been local and for that work to take place locally if it could do. And they wanted more options and things that they could study within the school setting. But then they were asked to talk about mainstream and what would you like to see change at mainstream. And that was a little bit more damning. They wanted to see a whole scale change in approach and the ethos to SEN, the awareness of need, the environment itself the very nature of a site of a, of a mainstream school and the size of classes. Bullying was an issue that came up a lot in those comments from the point of view they felt their child was indeed being targeted in some way. And probably the one uh, <laughs> that I can't deny that is there, that is not a very savoury one to talk about, 
to the politics of yes, of course we can meet your child's need and we'll find out what they are later when it goes wrong. And that's often tied to funding. And that reality is there. Parents are not stupid. They know there is a funding trap. And I'm, I'm not stupid either. I do know that the authorities don't have an open door policy on, on funds because we don't, you know, the country itself doesn't have the funds to do that. It's unfortunate to see that obviously Temple finds the same thing in America, that funding does make a big difference. Oh, I've gone quiet. I've gone off. I'll shout louder. Hang on. <laughs> so the reality... Oh, I'm back again. <laughs> Um, so that, that reality of a funding trap exists. It, it's a shame, but it's a reality. And I'm afraid we just have to deal with that as and when it happens. Perhaps the one thing that stuck out the most in most of the comments that was coming back from parents was this perception of one size fits all. That actually, rather than the provision meet the need of the child, the child must fit the provision. And that actually they, will, they would fit the position because we make it happen. When they were asked to rank it, there was very little change from what the past parents were saying to what the present parents were saying. Very little difference. These were some of the other additional comments that they made. And I, he I hear that again and again and again when parents come to see me. Present pupil population, we asked those. And again, the, the positive feature that came out, surprisingly, well, not surprisingly, were friends and staff. It was the other way around, though, and I think that's because our staff model those friendships for them. And actually, uh, over time, that will change, and the, their friendships become the more important side of what they, they feel. And the class size was also important to them, because they were used to classes of, of 20, 30, whereby now they were getting classes of five or eight. The negative features were often things like, for them, behaviour of the other peers in their school, even though it was a specialist setting. And that's true, I have to say, because I have young people in my setting whereby, although they may all have an underlying condition, and let's say it's on the autistic spectrum, you'll have young people that are very, you know, they're all individuals. The reality is some will physically implode when something becomes distressing or raises their anxiety levels. I've got others that will become anxious and then frustrated and they explode. And actually trying to marry those two together at times is very, very difficult. And actually what you rely on is the professional nature of your staff and, and as Matthew finds in this setting, the undying loyalty that they have to the young people. And that's great to see because actually that manages the setting for you. But they often found that difficult. I should point out that on the other side of the graph there, a lot of the kids also said, don't change anything. <laughs> Leave it alone. It's quite okay, thank you very much. We don't want anything changing. Travel was another problem for them. What can you remember about mainstream? And in their minds, it's, it's more fresh in their minds. They were quite happy with primary, most of them. Quite happy with what happened to them in primary. Secondary, no, they weren't happy with that at all. Too noisy, too big, behaviour issues, not being understood, and that actually that's where the main issues became, came to a head, really. Those are the kind of additional comments they made about special schools. and what they'd experienced. And it's great to see, because what you obviously get then all the time is that they have a very positive attitude to special schools, and that they love everybody that works in the special school area. <laughs> Particularly, I find, they love the head teacher. <laughs> Desperately. I'm not gonna say which girl that is that put that comment on there. <laughs> but however, I should point out, she had a very big smile on her face when she was writing it. <laughs> I did tell her that actually I'm going to use it on purpose, so one of my staff makes sure she knows. <laughs> These are some of the other additional comments that they made. These are more worrying. I want to pay particular note to the one at the bottom. I'm going to ask you a question. How long do you think that child had been in my school? Now I'll give you a choice. Four weeks, four months, four years. Four years. Yeah, four years. Four <coughs> years. Where were you in 2008? As educationalists, what the hell have we done to that child? <coughs> that four years later they couldn't talk about it because of the trauma they'd been through, because of the ideology and the political correctness of inclusion. 
For those of you that works, that's fantastic. But for those that it doesn't, that's the kind of damage it does that I'm expected to try and undo in the time that they're with me in a specialist setting. Nobody goes into education wanting that kind of thing to happen to a child, but it does. And that's criminal. We shouldn't allow that to happen. That four years after all this, they can't face something that had happened to them. So what do we learn from it all? We learn that parents, really, the most influential thing for them is actually having that specialism and actually having the things that talk about the life skills and the feeling and the knowledge and the acceptance of their child. Attainment was important, but it wasn't as influential as the issue of actually my child's ability to cope. And from the pupils, it was about feeling part of something. It was about feeling included, because actually that's what the specialist setting was doing, not the mainstream one. And the negatives were a distance from home, which I could do nothing about, but being ready for the wider world, I think, is a very fair one and is something that we work and strive for because, actually, you have to do that on an individual basis time and time again. So I, when I'd found all that out and put all that together, I thought, well, I've got to try and find some meaning from it. And I was looking around when doing some background read, and I came across a psychologist that said that. And it's the bit in red I want to point out, obviously. The will and desire to understand and be understood. That's inclusion. That is a true definition of inclusion. It's about the child feeling part of something and the parent feeling that their child matters and actually the child achieving something. That is what inclusion is really about. It's not about geography. It's not about that's where all the primary friends went to. It's about actually being understood. Now, you all know about the triad of impairment for autistic spectrum. I'm going to introduce you to another one. There it is. I call this MSD. You won't have heard of it because I've just made it up. Okay? <laughs> MSD is mainstream school disability. Because it's not the child that has the disability, it's the school. And that disability affects support services. Often to, uh, teaching assistants are perceived to be the be-all and end-all. And don't get me wrong, I've got some fantastic ones. I've got to say that, they're in the audience. Uh, <laughs> some of them are. Uh, there are. And I do, seriously, I do have some fantastic teaching assistants. And there are some fantastic, fantastic ones in mainstream as well. But often the answer is perceived to be, if I give them a teaching assistant, they'll cope in the mainstream. No, they won't. Therapeutic services are often difficult to even get in the mainstream, and when you do get them in the mainstream, child goes off to be therapt, comes back to English lesson, doesn't apply it, because I do that in therapy. <laughs> Don't do it over here. <laughs> Whereas, especially a school like mine, because it's so small, can actually take that therapy and make it the bedrock of the curriculum, and actually teach the curriculum around the therapy, because it's actually the therapy is the skill that they need, though that knowledge of social interaction and social communication skills, that's what matters, and everything else is hung on that. Environment, huge problem with environment. Too big, too noisy, too over-sensory stimulating for our young people. And as a result, unless, unless mainstreams do something about the environment, like we can do because we have the physical structure to do so, you will always find this problem. Curriculum and approach. Uh, again, is it about driving results or is it about actually making something meaningful to the child that's actually learning? Specialisms, special schools can do that because of the size that they have, because of the niche provision that they have, that is why they work, that is why the parents are saying what they're saying, and that is why the pupils say what they say. If you don't do that, I'm afraid that disability comes back. But that's not the child's disability, it's ours as an education service. Now, here's the interactive bit, okay? Now, you've got to join in, otherwise, I am going to look like a complete muppet. Okay? Now, most of my staff would say you do anyway, normally. Uh, now, I, I'm rather pathetic. I have to use a ringtone on my phone due to the fact that I'm not a virtuoso piano player, okay? So, you will know when to come in, okay? Trust me, you'll recognise this, okay?
If there's something strange in your neighbourhood, who are you going to call? Good, right, good, you've got it, you know who it is. I should point out, for those of you who struggle with this concept, the answers to the next question is not Ghostbusters. <laughs> so, level one of our little test. If your car breaks down, who are you going to call? AA. Okay, I'll go with AA. I have mechanic. <laughs> I'll go with AA, and in good BBC style, there are other breakdown skills. <laughs> if your pipes burst open, who are you going to call? <laughs> Very good. We're getting the hang of it now. Well done. <laughs> if you're feeling ill, Ill, Ill. If you're feeling ill, who are you going to call? Ah, <laughs> uh, Aspie. <laughs> <laughs> or a smart ass, take your pick. <laughs> Doctor, preferably NHS Direct because they'll put you off otherwise. Well done, we got through level one. Level two, we're all a bit more technical now. Got to be a think a bit more. If you have a heart problem, who are you going to call? Oh, very intelligent audience, obviously. If you have a broken bone, who are you going to call? Oh, very good. was a bit quiet at that time, I noticed. If you have a child with a medical difficulty, who are you going to call? Very good. Excellent. Well done. Well done. Moving on swiftly to level three. If your child has neurocognitive need, linguistic need, a hearing and visual impairment, a complex learning difficulty, attention deficit, a behavioural need, who are you going to call? Is it really going to be your local mainstream school? Be honest, and I'm not trying to be nasty to them. Be honest. If you're, you know, you've got a bit of a heart flutter, you're willing to call a cardiologist. You've got a broken arm, you're willing to call for an orthopaedic surgeon. Are you seriously telling me you're not prepared to look for something specialist for your child? Really? Come on. Aren't they a little bit more important than a broken bone? We should get into our heads the actual value of what special skills are about. I go back to what I perceive to be the meaning of inclusion the will and desire to understand and be understood. That's what situations like mine can give. Mine's not the only one, and it's not perfect by any means. None of us are. We're always learning ourselves all the time about the young people we deal with, and that requires us to work very closely with professionals and also the particularly parents from the point of view of understanding their child. But the important thing is that the, this time that they have, although they will spend more time as adults, this time that they have is the most influential in their lives, really. So we have to get it right. Now, to sum up, your entitlement, here's your maths homework, sorry. For me, the pros significantly outweigh the cons. And then there's a little quadratic equation for you to work out. Now, anybody in here a mathematician? Okay, joy, good. As a mathematical term, what does LCD stand for? Don't say liquid crystal display, that's science, forget it. Very good, top of the class. <laughs> Lowest common denominator. F I've already given you. F is funding. This might come back to the point you were just making over there. Lowest common denominator funding. What's the sign in the middle mean? It's not equal to. It's not equal to. Very good. SROI. Does anybody know what SROI stands for? It's very big in education right now is SORI. Oh, very good. Who said that? Very good. Excellent. Definitely top of the class. <laughs> Social return on investment. To sum it up, that equation means that. I wrote that statement 16 years ago. I don't see it being any different today. Until we accept that it, if we actually don't address this funding trap, which exists, and I know it exists there, and we have to try and deal with it as best we can, but the reality is we will not see what the real social return on those young people that come to settings like mine is. How do I know? Very simply, I'll tell you how I know. I get phone calls from young people that have moved on from me and now either in, maybe in specialist colleges, maybe in supported living, and they tell me how happy they are. And they come and show, at the open days, they come and tell us what they've been doing. I have a young man who left me, went to college, was the top student in that mainstream college, and starts here next term doing his degree. 
I've got another young man who's in his second year of doing a computer, de computer degree in, a, in Imperial College in London. And last year, I had an ex-pupil stood here talking to you, who is now teaching in Thailand. I don't need to worry about the social return on investment because I see it day in, day out. At whatever academic level they, they actually perform at, I see the benefits of that special education. The defence rests. You decide whether it should be specialist or inclusion. Thank you.